violence in America. It's a very interesting topic these days. Yeah, yeah they're right here, and you're, you're welcome to take one on your way. There he is, <laughs> Richard Curtis. And then the week after that, um, we on October 18th, we have Joel Duari. Um, he's going to be speaking about Middle East politics and the American presidential race. And October 25th, make it legal, marijuana legislation in 2012. So all of these are, these first ones of the quarter are, are timed before the election so that you can begin to think about these issues in maybe some new ways, hopefully. Do you only take about five and six period questions we can We're going to record them, and they'll be available somewhere for you to watch afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, how soon do you think they'll be available? Hi. Do you mind going around the front row? Or you can try I don't them. know. Uh, I think that they will just be on YouTube on the Seattle Central Community College Library Social um, Conversations and Social Issues. Um, yeah, that's our goal. Last year we never managed to record any of them, so we're taking this one step at a time and hopefully we'll be successful with it. Good to see you. So yeah, please do help yourself to one of those flyers if you'd like to know more. Oh, and if you want to make sense of the elections, you know, what, why does the election happen the way it does? Um, November, the election was on November 6th, November 1st here in this room, we're going to have um, probably a panel talking about making sense of election day. So, won't want to miss that. And then we get into some other social issues. Um, we have corporate land grabbing in developing countries with Tari Gede, one of the instructors here in geography. U.S. immigration policy, inclusion or exclusion, ESL instructor John Martinez, the politics of Islam in America, that's being put together, and uh, that's on the 29th of November, and then December 6th, health disparities, is racism killing us, with uh, psychology instructor Emila Molina. So I hope you're able to make it to some of those. So why is the library doing this? Well, I'm a librarian. My name is Kelly McHenry. And I got really got inspired when Occupy Seattle was here on our campus. I was inspired by all the wonderful conversations that went on between students and students and faculty and students and faculty and faculty and all the people on this campus. And so I wanted to keep a dialogue going about social issues. And it seemed like a natural connection for the library to have my opinion. Because what are libraries for? Well, we're about information. We're about having different kinds of information, different opinions, different viewpoints. And so by having a series where people can come and talk about ideas, and you all can express your own opinions in hopefully a very safe environment, you'll feel free to ask questions and, and discuss. Um, and we'll all have respect for each other, just like we have respect for different things out on the shelves. There's nobody in this room that would agree with everything that's in our library. I promise you. And there's nobody in this room that's going to agree on everything, anyway. So that's what this is all about, hearing things that we agree with or don't disagree with, and having conversation around them. With that in mind, <laughs> Um, I would like to introduce today's speaker. Um, he's one of our shining stars at Seattle Central. Yes, we snagged him from Shoreline Community College, where he was an administrator, um, where, but he also taught political science there. His name is Kenny Lawson, and he's the Dean for Social Humanities Social Sciences. And uh, please give him a warm welcome.
pursue any of the things that you're interested in with respect to the election and the media and politics. I do think it probably makes sense to frame this a little bit and talk just a little bit about um, the historical evolution of the media and how the media functions in our political system today, what role it serves. So if you could bear with me, I would like to do that for about 10 minutes or so, give you a sense for at least my analysis of the media, um, and then kind of open it up for a more, uh, more give and take and more conversation about the role of the media and how that influences our political system. So the first thing that I always like to remind anybody that wants to understand the relationship between the political system and the media is to think about the structure of the media and the way that it's incentivized today. So when you think about how you get your news information or how you get your information about politics, how or what sources do you tend to turn to? And this is a completely unrepresentative sample of the way most Americans are likely to get their news. But give me a sense. Go ahead and we'll make this part of our conversation. Where do you get your, your political information? TV. TV. Yeah. Um, what, what kinds of TV do you watch to get your, your political yeah. information? Do you watch the local news channels or cable news? Same. Kind of variety show. of sorts. What's that? Daily Show. Daily Show. I was going to say, like John Stewart, um, apparently in this age demographic, that is a pretty major source of news. It's probably more accurate than some of the things you get on the more serious news channel. There was actually a study done that not that long ago that people that watch John Stewart got had a more accurate um, understanding of certain policies and events than people that watch cable news. Um, so in some ways, I want to pick a little bit up on cable news, because I do think a lot of Americans are starting to get their news from that source. I encourage you to read the newspaper, um, and there are some great blogs out there too, but cable news is not a great source for your political information if what you're looking for is accurate and detailed descriptions about the policies that politicians are interested in adopting and passing and, and implementing. So again, think about cable news as one example, but it's even partly true of something like the New York Times. What is their primary driver? What are, they, what are their incentives, as I suggested earlier? I want to talk a little bit about what incentivizes them. Money. Money? You said that. Money? And how do they get money? By being a sponsor or saying the right thing in order to have somebody support them. Okay, right. Go ahead, what? Newspaper sales and advertising. So newspaper sales and newspapers sell advertising, and the cable news channels are no different, right? They essentially are trying to sell advertising, right? That's the business model. So if you're a major news provider, and by the way, most of these news providers are pretty large. They're public corporations, many of them, right? Most of them. So we're talking a huge, large corporations providing most of the media and political information that you consume. And they're in business, essentially, and they need to make money. Right? So how do they do that exactly? They sell advertising. And what, is, what does that mean for them in terms of the kinds of information they're going to provide? If part of what they're worried about is making sure they sell advertising. Okay, so you're exactly on the right track, right? What do they want to do? They want to make sure that they are providing appealing information that people are going to want to watch, right? It has to be um, the kind of information that's going to keep people involved and engaged in the program. They want to hold on to your eyeballs, right? Because then they can go back to those people that are interested in advertising and they can say, we've got 20% of the market share watching our news program. And so we're going to charge you this much for the advertising. So what does that do to the character of the news when the news organizations are making sure that they are keeping their market share, and keeping the eyeballs? What do you think that does to the character of the news? Go ahead. It, it creates a huge bias. Um, it's, it's where the dollars are. It's, it's not necessarily you know, the viewpoints, um, accurate viewpoints. It's just whoever's there. Okay, so there's not necessarily a huge concentration on the accuracy of information, 
because, again, if the incentive is primarily to maintain a viewership and maintain audience share, primarily you want to make sure that people are interested in your programming. So, yeah. And they're also not going to go after the people that fund them, so they're not going to like report what yeah. of their funders do that impacts their politics. Very good point. Right, so some of the news organizations, in fact, are owned by companies like General Electric. General Electric is a huge defense contractor, for example. Right, so if those large corporations are interested in making sure that they um, are keeping sort of their, the corporate bosses happy, they're not gonna maybe pursue stories that are gonna be super critical of the businesses in which those corporations are operating. Right, does that make sense to everybody? All right, so very good point. I want to go back to this idea, though, about the content of the news itself and what, particularly what happens on cable news programs because there, there's a huge competition in terms of maintaining viewership um, because you, you're basically trying to provide some kind of information 24-7 that's going to pe keep people engaged, right? <coughs> How many of you, by the way, watch C-SPAN? A few of you watch C-SPAN? <laughs> <laughs> not always the most engaging kind of television, right? It's like you're watching people give speeches on the floor of the, um, of the Congress and so on. So, um, you know, that's got a pretty low market share. But news channels, they have to sell advertising. So what do they do with information? They sensationalize the information. And they look for things to make a story interesting and dramatic. And you know what? Sometimes the facts, and particularly political policies, aren't all that dramatic, right? So how many of you watched the debate last night? Anybody watch the analysis after the debate? What did, did you notice anything about that analysis? Yeah. Did it carefully go through um, the claims made by each candidate and, and check whether or not there's gonna be a certain consequence if a, if a policy is adopted? Did it check to see whether or not the candidates accurately portrayed their policies. They were it seemed like they were more worried about the style and not like the facts or the policies that would impact us. They were more worried about like who had his meter or like stuff like that. Yeah, and that's the way I would argue that a lot of our media now is delivered to us, or a lot sorry, not the media delivered to us, but the, our political information is delivered to us in this highly sensationalized way in which we really don't get a lot of attention to the actual consequences of policies <coughs> and the actual policies that are being um, put forth by certain candidates. Um, so what was one of the things that happened last night in the debate in terms of policies? What was the um, one of the kind of back and forths that... that Medicare. Um, so Medicare, okay, good. Taxes. Taxes. They went back and forth about who's tax plan was right and wrong and so on, right? Um, so President Obama claimed that um, Mitt Romney wanted to have a $5 trillion tax cut. And Mitt Romney said, no, I don't. And President Obama said, yes, you do. And Mitt Romney said, no, I don't. And what did Jim Lehrer say about this? He's the debate moderator, right? Don't we want to know, do you want to know as a citizen or as someone that's interested in American politics, do you want to know if that's true or not? No. Did you get a sense for whether or not that claim is true? I think for people that don't pay attention to politics, they might have believed in it wrongly because, you know, when they talk about it, So say that again? Um, like people that don't pay attention to politics, maybe, I think some of them might believe what Romney said because like what he said didn't really chance like challenge it wasn't challenged by the moderator. Right. And I don't know if any of you know this, but there is the way that the debates are structured in some ways reflects the kind of information that we get. And it's this overall pattern that I would argue is reflected in the way politics is covered. So the debates actually don't allow for the candidates to question one another. That's up to... They don't allow debates. <laughs> they don't allow debates. But the moderator can ask questions, 
The moderator, Jim Lehrer, just sort of sat there like a potted plant. He didn't ask any questions. He didn't probe, you know, is what uh, what about the truth of this claim or this assertion that you're going that you Mitt Romney are gonna uh, implement a five billion dollar tax <coughs> or five trillion dollar tax cut over ten years. Um, none of that gets played out in the media. And by the way, that's this is I'm just giving you one example, right? But I would suggest to you that it's a pattern, that a lot of the ways in which media, or I'm sorry, political information is delivered, is delivered in a way that increases the drama of it, reports on the horse, you know, the horse race of a political campaign, and not on the things that are probably gonna actually affect you. And part of that is because the media, again, is trying to keep market share and keep your viewership. That makes sense to everybody? All right. Yeah. I just wanted to throw in something. It's my understanding, maybe I'm wrong, but that, that the debates, the rules of the of the debates are negotiated with the yes. candidates in a way that I would assume, you know, the, each one wants to protect themselves right. from being questioned or from being challenged or from being cut off when their time is over, that kind of thing. It also would it would affect the, the way the debates go. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. So there's the policy. I mean, there's the politicians themselves um, that play a role in how the debates are structured. Um, but in the end, we don't get a lot of good, detailed policy information, and again, the things that would really affect our lives. Um, so we get a pretty um, watered down, if you will, understanding of what the politicians are proposing. And not very right. right. Now, I wanted to make one of, oh, go ahead. I, can you, I, I think that's actually more important than your um, acknowledging in the moment here, because the, the the debates used to be organized by media outlets who would invite the candidates. Now the debates are organized by a private corporation owned by the Democratic Party and the Republican Party collectively, not a media outlet. And so that private corporation is organizing a debate, and it's not it's not interested necessarily in the things that elect the voters are interested. It's interesting what the two parties are interested in. Right. Which, and what are the two parties interested in? Well, they're excluding everyone else, number one. Well, there's, so there's one other issue that's sort of floating out here that we haven't raised yet. And there, I wanna, I'm going to make like two other points, and then I will open it up to your, to your questions. But one of the main issues is actually the influence of money itself. Because part of the way we get our news or get our information about political candidates is through things like television news, and maybe events like the debate. Another way we get our information are through the the, own, the candidates ads themselves, right? I'm sorry. So how do they get to play those ads or place those ads? They have to raise money, right? So you hopefully you're kind of seeing where I'm going with this. There's a There becomes a very strong connection between being able to um, provide your, your case to the voters and your need to raise money so you can buy that ad space or those ads to um, reach out to um, people that you were hope that you will hope to um, vote for you. So of course now that means that politicians spend gobs and gobs of their time actually not paying attention to the policies they might want to put in place anyway, and instead they raise lots of money so that they can buy ads and win elections. So the influence of money in elections has grown pretty phenomenally. And it's changed very recently with an important Supreme Court case that just came down, um, I want to say 2008. Maybe it was more recent than that. Anybody know? Citizens United case? 2000, maybe it was 2010? 2010? Citizens United uh, was a Supreme Court case in which the Supreme Court ruled that People spending their own money to promote a particular candidate was a matter of protected free speech. What does that do in terms of the balance um, of ordinary people being able to sort of voice their opinions and people with lots of money being able to voice their opinions? That's a leading question. And to some extent, it's always been that way, where those with the resources um, 
certainly have more access to politicians and more access to the media to be able to promote their points of view. So that's probably true. But there have been some restrictions around exactly how candidates are allowed to spend money, how they're allowed to raise money, and also <coughs> some provisions about how voters get to know who is donating to those campaigns. So there's been, a, in some respects, some accountability. Um, even, and again, those, this is all relative, right? But Citizens United, I would suggest, throws more of the relative weight to those with um, money in terms of being able to sway um, the public and in terms of having access to media to promote a particular point of view. So now independent groups can go out, produce their own spots. They don't have to be sponsored by campaigns at all um, and can certainly influence the way voters view things. Um, so the influence of money is an important piece in, in this whole system uh, as well. Okay. Then the last thing I think is worthwhile to talk about is maybe the standards of journalism and how that gets, um, how that plays out in terms of the kinds of political information that you get. When you think about journalists and how journalists are trained, and Jeff, feel free to, to <coughs> chime in at any point. Um, how are most journalists trained in terms of how they're supposed to report the news? They're supposed to be unbiased, right? So if you go to journalism schools, you would get some training about how to be objective. How many of you think the news is objective? By a show of hands. No? No one thinks the news is objective? Depends on what media outlet. OK. Um, so before going into what media outlet, how many of you think that the news is biased towards, say, the left? There's a liberal bias in the media. No one thinks that? OK, we got to come on, yeah. So a couple of people think that there's a liberal bias. How many of you think there's a conservative bias in the news or in the media? I thought you said there was a liberal one. Oh, well, OK. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see a show of hands again. <coughs> this is too hard for me to believe. So how many of you think there's a conservative bias? So that you get kind of these, uh, almost a status quo story um, that tends to be reflected in the news. A couple of you. <laughs> and how many of you think there's a liberal bias in the news? Okay, there's a few of you. Um, since this is supposed to be a conversation, you're going to have to help me out here a little bit. What do you? Where? In what ways do you think there's a liberal bias? So you have raised your hand a couple of times. You're willing to say, in, in some respects, how a liberal bias gets reflected in the in the information that we get. Okay. Give it some thought. Do you? Sure. Well, I, I hear like, well, I'm like a bit more liberal, but I hear a lot about the liberal media. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's kind of true to a certain extent because, like, outside of news sources, like, say, entertainment, like, um, like, just take SNL, for instance, like, they tend to be more liberal and, like, certain sources of news that are more deliberate in terms of the, the slant that they provide to the news, right? So for those of you that don't know, right, Fox is more conservative, right? It's pretty obvious um, just if you look at sort of their issues and, and how, they, how they cover things. And then likewise, you probably find some outlets that are more liberal. You had your hand up back there too about more li a liberal bias. Do you anything I to share? I had up for both actually. Okay, well, share with us. What, in what way do you think you're biased? the same way regardless print, web, television, that depending on your source, I think someone over here said that, it's going, you know, for the most part, it is biased. You, you'll see an attack on a campaign advertisement where the words have been switched around or it was cut off or it was a, something that happened when it wasn't an issue, and then you'll see the same thing. From the other side, uh, you know, from a conservative viewpoint, 
against Obama or a Democratic viewpoint against Romney, where they'll, you know, it's moved around, or in general, jobs, whatever the, unless it's a cut and dry news story, where you just, and even then sometimes, it can be altered. Yep. I think you can find where people are not coming from a place where they are trying to remain unbiased and open and just report what the facts are without altering them with their own mindset. Okay, so I, I would give you all a, an assignment, a little homework assignment. Um, you can turn it into me tomorrow and I'll grade it. <laughs> Um, go take a look at, an, at a story, um, any political story of your choosing, uh, and do it first from, the news, from a newspaper, and see if you can't figure out exactly what the bias is. Here's what journalists are generally trained in. Um, you're supposed to get sources from both sides of the story or multiple angles of the story, right? And then report on that. So if you're gonna report on a particular, say, tax policy, you would go and you would hear, maybe you're gonna report on Mitt Romney's tax policy. So you go, figure out what his proposal is, report that. Then to be objective, what's your next step? You gotta go get the other point of view, right? So you go interview someone from um, the Democratic Party, get a quote from them, stick it in your paper, and you call that objective. Do you see any issue or problem with that practice in terms of actually getting at some truth, <coughs> some accuracy? just like showing it's two different opinions and not like the journalist should get the straight facts you know right. report the facts mm -hmm. not just your sense there's of been this practice and again Deb, feel free to chime in but there's been this practice that has emerged in anybody else that seems to suggest that objectivity just means reporting what people say and that is objective I mean it's very objective you're saying here's what this person said here's what this person said no reporter opinion in that um, and you just report both sides and it's almost as if you don't do it that way then you're going to be accused of bias or you're being you might be accused of not being professional even the problem with it though is that there's no actual investigation of whether or not any given statement is true which means whoever's willing to lie the most or mislead, I should say, mislead the most, right, can pretty much get away with it and still be objective. And again, go do the assignment. Go see if, in fact, when you read the newspaper article, that's not the structure of the paper. Now, it's not to say, or of the article, it's not to say that journalists, too, don't in some ways frame an article and frame a story, and they will. And I would suggest to you, look at today's New York Times. And they covered the debate, right? What was one of the things that was covered about the debate? Anybody read the New York Times this morning? No? Yeah. yeah. What what got covered? It was one of the like what was some of uh, the scarce print space devoted to? So I looked online and saw a very in depth story and timelines about hand gestures. Right. <laughs> right. So there's this deep analysis of body language. What the crap is that? Um, we spend time journalists are spending time covering body language and all this or the other kind of absurd stuff, and, and do you have the same analysis of policies and um, fact-checking around policies? Even fact-checking becomes, he said this, she said that. The fact-checkers aren't even very accurate, one could argue. Um, so, to me, just the whole level of discourse is pretty absurd on, on some level. That it's really not about what really, what is expert opinion saying? What does, what do the facts say? Let's do some real investigation. And I'd say investigative journalism itself has declined as a result of the incentives that I talked about at the very beginning, which is that news outlets are trying to make a profit. Investigative reporting costs money, right? Because you gotta really get a journalist to go out there and investigate, get multiple sources, and really, Get up to speed on a particular issue. That costs money. So most media outlets have gone to a beat system where you get a journalist and they just cover a particular issue. They get contacts established in that particular area. So right, um, someone will be a correspondent to the White House. So when you see someone deliver a story, they'll say, I'm on the White House beat or something like that. 
And what do those journalists then, what do they have to maintain? They have to maintain their access and their contacts. So are they gonna be super critical of politicians? Not when they wanna maintain those contacts and their access to those politicians because that's the source of their quotes so they can write their story. And it's actually for the news organizations, it's a more efficient, cost-effective way to, to deliver the news. But for you all as the public, you get less information. Does that make sense to everyone, the logic of that? Yeah. Well, I'm guessing with the first statement about the body language is if you give them a statement or a question and see how they react to it by their movement and their facial expressions, mm -hmm. that, then they, that would determine if it's true or not. I mean, I think, you know, I would rather not judge whether or not someone's policy and statement is true based on their body language, but actually go investigate. Um, it, what did Mitt Romney propose in his tax policy? He proposed to cut rates. In studies which suggest, and there, you know, you can always debate a little bit about, especially when you're trying to extrapolate what will the implications or consequences of this policy be. For Mitt Romney, he argues that he's gonna cut rates and some analysts, independent analysts, this is what Obama referred to, and he did so accurately, that if, Ob if Romney cuts the rates as he proposes, there will be a $5 trillion cost um, to the government over a period of 10 years, right? Now, Mitt Romney says that actually he's gonna cut some loopholes, deductions, and so on. And that's gonna make, that's gonna help pay for that. But do you, did anybody get that out of that debate last night? Try to get that? Did, what, what deductions and loopholes is Mitt Romney gonna close? He doesn't give specifics. No, you wanna know why he's not gonna give specifics? He doesn't. Because it's not popular. <laughs> One, actually there's not enough loopholes to close, so it's not possible. And two, most of those deductions and loopholes are actually quite popular. Most middle class Americans get who own homes get a tax deduction for the interest they pay on their homes. And if you actually say to the American people, well, you are gonna no longer get that deduction, that's not gonna be politically popular. Again, we don't get into those kinds, that's what I'm suggesting. We don't get into those kinds of details um, in our discourse, particularly as it's presented in the media. One of the arguments that Obama used when uh, Romney brought that up, though, was that Obama was going to do, make the exact same cuts and close the exact same loopholes. And his only argument against Romney, when Romney said that he was going to close his loopholes, was that Obama had specified which he would cut, and that Obama hadn't specified anything. And that's Obama's only argument against it, is that he knows which ones he's going to cut, and he says it to the public. Obama knows which ones he's going to cut, the his, loopholes? He didn't... Um, from what I, I don't think Obama's proposing to change the rates like um, that Romney is. From what I heard last night, I don't know if it's the same thing, but he, um, Romney was talking about how he was going to close the loopholes and stuff, and Obama's argument was that he was going to do the exact same thing, but that he specified his mm -hmm. in yeah. the That's what, okay. Right, so um, now bear in mind, Obama is not claiming that he's going to cut all the loopholes and pay for the tax cuts that Romney wants. So, but he is saying he's gonna cut some loopholes because he wants to balance the budget. To do that, you need to both raise revenue, um, which would be increasing taxes, cutting loopholes, or closing loopholes, that kind of thing. So he's being more specific and detailed about what he's proposing. My, and I don't wanna to get too down into the weeds on this particular policy. What I want to suggest is that the way that the issue itself gets covered in the media is at a very abstract level and not at a very concrete level where you, we can actually begin to have a, a real conversation about it, be, part because of the structure of the media itself, um, isn't all that interesting. There's one other side note that I can't help but kind of want to make too, and that is the whole way, in, particularly in cable news, but the whole way in which there is a pundit class that has emerged in terms of how we get our information. So there are these talking heads, right, who are paid actually millions of dollars to analyze the news for us and comment on the news. And um, some of the things, I mean, just again, go read the New York Times, read Gail Collins. 
Tell me what political substance comes out of one of her columns. It's it's become sort of entertainment news. All right, yeah. I have two questions. So you talked about reporting the news, the local news does. Where does the responsibility go on us as citizens not to be a critical thinker? I mean, I can read a story and go, that's BS. It just doesn't line up. I mean, where does our responsibility come not to believe everything we hear on television, not to believe everything we read in the newspaper, and use our own judgment? and seek the truth, like, hmm, that doesn't quite sound right. Part two, you're talking about the media, so you're telling me the whole media system is corrupt, so say I wanna be a journalist, I walk into a news station or a paper, and I wanna be this responsible journalist. That's not allowed, I have to go with the corporation. Well, I, I don't know that I've stated it quite that strongly, but yeah, that's the, I would say there are strong pressures that you are supposed to report things in a certain way, and you'll be trained to report things in a certain way. There are, of course, uh, there's been a, an explosion of ways in which we can get our information. And so not everything is cable news or even a major uh, newspaper. So there might be a lot of room, actually, in alternative news organizations and so forth to get some, some worthwhile news about policy details and about, um, about politics. So I'm, I'm sort of more addressing the mainstream media. So first point. Second thing, which is really your first question, was how do we be critical consumers? And so perhaps it's no accident we're in the library, right? Which library, the library is in many ways the heart and soul of trying to teach you all information literacy. How do you assess information? Whether or not that information is accurate, um, how do you assess um, the strengths and weaknesses of that information? Where does the source come from? Is it a credible source? All those things. So I think that is a responsibility of us as citizens to be informed, informed about things. That does mean, though, that instead of just watching the football game, I might have to spend a little more time reading politics. That's easy for me to say. I love politics, political scientists, so um, I already have an interest in that. Maybe other people would, have, would rather watch football and do other things than read about policy. So, um, but I would suggest to you we get sort of what we deserve as a citizenry. We are interested in hearing about the, you know, the policy implications. Uh, of a given uh, issue, then we'll, we'll get those policies, and we'll get those politicians. All right, other questions, comments, thoughts? Yeah? I was wondering uh, what kind of ads should we pay attention to, because I see ads where it's actually done by the uh, people that are elected, and then friends of the elected, and just um, by different companies. Which one should we pay attention to? Well, um, I haven't been out of the classroom so long that I don't know how to turn back a question. So what do y'all think? None of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say all of them. Um, but you just have to look through, you know, look through the lens of who's trying to tell you what and why. Um, it, to, to ignore any, you know, any information that uh, whatever politician is, is trying to throw at you, it's, it's just, um, it's kind of like walking around with your hands clapped over your ears. Um, because no matter what they're saying, be it you know, be it accurate or, or misleading, it's it's telling you, it's giving you information at what the most important very important. I think that's a really good well, question. Okay, wait, wait a second, wait a second. But remember, remember the remember the survey about the about the Daily Show. Mm -hmm. People who are watching the mainstream media, which is going to mean people who are watching those commercials, know less people about who are critically watching. Whatever media source they're watching is, is the point I'm trying to make. Now, I see. Now, I, well, I, I, I think there's a distinction to be made between advertising as a form of communication and other forms of communication, and that's why it's reasonable to say advertising you should just ignore. But, but that, but to say ignore newspapers who are sending reporters to ask questions, well, that's hiding your head in the sand. That's the blinders. I think advertising, ignoring the advertising, is actually opening your eyes because mm. the advertising are a blinder that they're throwing up to confuse you, just just give you a whole bunch of bizarre. Um, images to look at instead of the actual information. Well, and the advertising has gotten incredibly sophisticated as well, so a lot of focus yeah, groups yeah. go into that. 
Um, but kind of, I think the question here was there are also a lot of ads now being played or sponsored by folks that aren't necessarily connected to the campaign. Um, I would tend to, to side more a little bit more over here rather than with, um, with Dr. Curse here that in some respects, um, I think the ads do tell you something about the candidate. Um, but again, if it were, if I were giving you advice, I would hope that you would always remember that in, uh, uh, the information contained in an ad is an ad. And the so, I mean, in some ways I'm supporting your point, but in a news story, it's a different kind of information. Information literacy, right? The source of that information can matter in terms of the message, and so be critical. As long as you have that critical outlook, I think ads do give you a, something. Um, they tell you something about the candidates, but only if you're aware and analyzing the fact that it's a political ad and it's meant to get your vote or get somebody's vote. And actually, that's kind of interesting too. Sometimes they may not be targeting you at all, um, but who are they targeting and what are they appealing to? Mm. That is significant for candidates. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think that in the last four years, particularly, um, campaign ads have really changed the way that they do things, and now they don't try to express the candidate's policy that they're working for. They're trying to attack the opposition, and so. It's really difficult for me to watch a campaign ad and think I'm taking something away from this when all I hear is from Romney's side, Obama's doing this, Obama's doing that. From Obama's side, Romney's doing this, Romney's doing that. There's no, there's no comparison. There's no way to discern any type of information from that. It's just an attack. Yeah, there's a lot of that. I agree. Yeah. Um, one of the greatest concerns we should have as observers or readers is the factor of fear. All ads, especially political ads, or even I call them opinions on the opinion page, whether it's the New York Times or otherwise, is about one basic fallacy that most of us learn in maybe philosophy or an intro to philosophy. All of the logical fallacies. And if you took a campaign ad, brought it to your classroom, you could apply over 50% such as hasty generalization, appeal to emotion, post hoc ergo, because of this, therefore the other. And I think that could be a fun exercise. You could mm -hmm. bring in an ad or go to YouTube and find an ad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sounds like a good English 102 exercise. There it is. Oh, no, not just 102. No, I Okay. I, you're, you're teaching that this morning. We need lots of practice. Cover 
different article and cover page. And oh, the US and covers for the different editions. Yeah, and so the international edition had a <clears throat> pretty contra what would have been in the United States a very controversial issue, probably around I think around war, if I remember correctly. And the U.S. version was uh, just avoided like it entirely. It was yeah. you know kind of what how do how are we dealing with stress or something like that. Um, so I do suggest that international sources of news can sometimes give you a more critical view um, of American politics. So I don't know. The librarians have any other thoughts? Thoughts about that? Well, there are just a range of publications and, and radio shows. If you if you have a, an app on your phone called Tune it in, Tune In, you can go to so many different radio stations. And, and I've been looking at some different things um, for a while, like Al Jazeera. I thought yeah. that would be very biased, but it seems to be excellent, a, a lot less biased than the, the media here. Look around at different places. Yeah, I just want to. I just want to uh, piggyback on that. Um, I, I've been pretty jaded with with uh, U.S. media outlets. Um, you know, I thought that um, it was the cold climate objective um, reporting, and and it is. Um, you, you do have to sift through a lot of garbage, but there, you know, interna international sources are so important, and I'm and I'm just learning this, and I'm so excited to, to be learning this. Um, like. Al Jazeera, um, Le Monde Diplomatique, um, which we actually have access to through um, the, the library. The library, here, which is <laughs> awesome. Um, it's just, it's so important for you know, to get those outside perspectives. And it's so accessible, it's just we're not told about, right? Unless you attend Seattle Central. <laughs> <laughs> we're telling you. to the source and what you know, what kind of um, perspective they're providing. The way that I, uh, I will share with you kind of how I try to um, digest news and collect news and get news is I do rely a lot on a certain um, set of blogs that I re read routinely. But there, I, I actually like to get a diverse point of view. So I have some blogs that are more left-leaning and some that are a little more right-leaning. And the ones I really rely on are ones that are a little bit more on the wonky side, which just kind of fits my interest. Um, so there are a couple, and some of these are kind of are done by academics, and so they, they tend to be more research-oriented. And I kind of rely on those as a way that I can filter the news now um, so that I can judge, well, what's is that an accurate story? or? What's the what's the data behind a certain issue? So, if you want some of those recommendations, I'm happy to give you those um, afterward. Tell us what wonky means, because <laughs> it's different what you mean than what. Oh really? I um, think what wonky means to me is um, stories or information that really talks about policies and the implications of policy. So lots of graphs and data and numbers, those kinds of things. That's, that means what is wonky? Yeah, you're welcome. Wonky means <laughs> crazy. Oh, yeah, there's oh. aliens controlling Romney's and aliens. Oh. That's what wonky would have meant. Okay, <laughs> thank you for the <laughs> clarification. Uh, I also want to say that you'd be amazed at how much information you have access to within your government. You know, you can, I mean, it's say looking for a new source, you all don't always have to find somebody to take it in and put it back out for you to read. You had this all kinds of things to freedom of information act or just or just like this public information that you have access to on government websites on local websites yeah i want to put in a plug for c-span at this point because yeah. if you haven't watched c-span just turn it on in my opinion it is the only true documentary news information that you can find um, in not print format or not primary source format. They don't even move the camera. It's, <laughs> it's that objective. Someone just turns the camera on and it is 
boring sometimes, but it's really, really great if you can see or catch something you're interested in. Except when they have the call-in shows. Oh, I haven't seen the call-in shows. Can you say what C-SPAN is? Yeah, it's, it's basically just setting up in some room where some legislative action or government action is taking place and literally someone turns the camera on and just shoots what's happening in the room and that's it. And you see the government happening, you see policy being made, you see conference sessions happening. No commentary, no, no layer. I'm a fan. <laughs> that might be for some people kind of like wonky. Not really in the young man's channel. Any other questions? Any questions about um, the political campaign that your campaigns in the election that you're seeing? Any observations or questions about it? Yeah. Questions? I, I'd like to know if anybody was on the fence if people had already made up their mind without policy, without watching if, if like how many people are on the fence haven't decided or were undecided. So how many people undecided? Want, Anybody undecided? Not who you're voting for, but if you were at some point in the past even six months weren't sure. Not me, but I guess my undecided is I know who I'm not voting for. I'm not voting for Romney or Obama, but I'm, looking, I'm researching third, third party candidates. I'd um, like to know um, if there's anybody who would like to register to vote. We have, we have registration forms at the library reference desk. If you haven't registered to vote and you're eligible to vote, you have to be 18 and a U.S. citizen. Um, just a couple of things and then feel free. Um, the, if you are a registered voter, you'll get a voter's pamphlet and I encourage you to read through that voter's pamphlet. It's not, it's, you know, it's gonna give you at least some pretty solid information that is reasonably trustworthy. <laughs> um, so it's a good place to start in terms of educating yourself about particular points of view and who you might vote, vote for. Um, I'd point out that political scientists are kind of interested in this election because uh, most of the electorate is actually already decided. A much smaller slice of the public who uh, is still out there thinking, hmm, I don't know who to vote for me, may have my mind. So, kind of interesting. Do you want to add one? Well, I was going to just, again, repeat your question. It seems like, like this is all getting worse and worse, especially with Citizens United. Is there any hope? I always, have actually hope. Democracy. I always have hope, I just can't help it. Um, Marilyn will tell you, sort of my, my um, I'm, I'm optimistic kind of by nature. Um, so I do have hope, but the hope is kind of with all of you. Um, so. Hey, I'd like us to give a warm thank you. so many good comments so come back again next thursday every thursday 12 to 1 except for thanksgiving weekend